Welcome to 2012 Heimold Reading. I'm Joseph Lennon, the Director of Irish Studies. Um, and this is the third reading in Villanova's Literary Festival. Um, I'm calling tonight the Irish Literary Festival, uh, because that's what it is for tonight. The Literary Festival carries throughout the semester. This is the first year where we've had the Heimold and the Literary Festival coincide. Um, we're lucky this year to have Hugo Hamilton uh, as the Charles A. Heimbold Jr. Chair of Irish Studies. Before I introduce, or before we introduce Hugo, however, I'd like to say a few words of thanks uh, to individuals who have helped make this possible. Um, Alan Drew and Lisa Sewell, professors of English, who uh, run the Literary Festival, as well as Afton Woodward, um, and Katie Hines, who have done a lot of the legwork, not all of the legwork, for setting this up. Um, Cindy Farrell and Susan Burns, who also helped um, with logistics. I also want to thank uh, Evan Radcliffe and the Dean of Arts, Jean Ann uh, Linney. Evan is the Chair of English, uh, and the former Director of Irish Studies, James Murphy, for making this happen, because all of them are the ones who um, continue to uh, keep this afloat and um, put back into it. Um, a few announcements. The Irish language, Australia, will be spoken here again next semester. I say again because I'm sure it was spoken here before. Um, we have um, the Irish language will be taught. Um, there will be two Irish language courses, one in the fall and one in the spring. And they will, this is for all the undergraduates here who have not done their language requirement yet. Um, the two semesters will complete your language requirement. Um, and it's on a regular uh, course basis like uh, French or Spanish. Uh, on the 22nd, next Thursday, we're having Kaylee in the library. Um, the Irish dance team is going to perform. Uh, Michelle Smith is here. Uh, and uh, the Philadelphia Kaylee group will be here. Um, this event is, in a way, a celebration of <coughs> Um, the Philadelphia Cayley Group because the library has digitized their audio archives um, and their physical archives, their um, manuscript archives. Um, Mick Maloney helped found the Philadelphia uh, Cayley Group in the 70s and so it's appropriate that their archives are here. So the Cayley is in some ways a celebration of that, it's a celebration of Irish studies, a celebration of the Irish American Heritage Month, um, which is March. This is an event open to everyone. My four-year-old son is coming, so I encourage everybody to come out um, to sing, to dance, uh, and have a good time. Um, we'll get some poems and songs out of a few noteworthy people, I hope, I believe. The next readings in the Literary Festival, um, is it Tia Obrecht? Tia. Tia, thank you, Tia Obrecht. Uh, the Orange Prize winner for The Tiger's Wife, uh, the novelist, will be reading here April 12th uh, in the cinema at 7 p.m. And um, William Kennedy, the Pulitzer Prize winning uh, author, um, Irish American author, will read April 26th at 7 p.m. in the cinema. And those are the last two uh, readers for the Irish, sorry, uh, sorry. I, I can't help saying it, uh, for the literary festival. Uh, and the Literary Festival is just up on Facebook, so if you could please friend that. If you don't know what that means, ask one of the undergraduates. It's been a great pleasure to get to know Hugo um, and his wife Mary Rose this semester. Uh, he is the first of our Heimbold chairs to be both Irish and German, or indeed probably to be Irish and something else. Uh, a combination that is the subject of his memoirs. I'm a great fan of his novel, Hand in the Fire. Uh, and its outsider-insider perspective, which Alexa and Joseph have, have just read and will be doing an um, introduction for Hugo in a moment. I just want to say a word about his memoir, The Speckled People, which is over there for sale, as is Hand in the Fire. Um, I think this is the most significant memoir that's come out of Ireland in the last 20 years. And I don't say that lightly. Um, he recently turned it into a play at the Gate Theatre, which Patrick Mason directed. Patrick Mason was here um, last semester um, as uh, a speaker for, uh, to celebrate the Villanova's connection with the Abbey Theatre. Um, 
I want to only mention one aspect of the speckled people that I found uh, the most profound. It's a few lines about inheritance um, delivered by the child narrator. And I asked Hugo if he was going to read this, so he's not. There are things you inherit from your father, too. Not just a forehead or a smile or a limp, but other things like sadness and hunger and hurt. You can inherit memories you'd rather forget. Things can be passed on to you as a child, like helpless anger. It's all there in your father's voice, as if you were born with a stone in your hand. The idea of inheriting memories is something we feel or know, but we may not often consider. This is one of Hugo's great contributions to literature. He writes about things that we know and feel, and maybe in America, on some level, inside or outside, emerging in different communities more than in Ireland, being on the outside from an insider's perspective. To writing, he brings empathy, an eye for the margin, and great turns of phrase. I want to ask um, Joe and Alexa to come up here, um, who have been a part of the literary festival class this semester with Lisa and Alan, and they're going to give a proper introduction. Someone who both emotionally and physically is lost in a unfamiliar country 
though at the same time our class felt frustrated by his obtuseness and naivete. The complexity of Vid's narrative and his friendship with Kevin Buchanan often forced us to question if everything in Vid's life was as stable as it seemed. The acclaimed novel has been lauded by critics for its profoundness. It was called Magnificently Lucid by The Independent and a rewarding reading providing a fresh perspective on Irish society by The Irish Times. In addition, Booker Prize winning author Anne Enright said that in his strength and grace, Hamilton's work glows. Hand in the Fire is not a simple read, but a complex novel whose characters have confounding relationships that require a delving into for more complete understanding. Additionally, in the sometimes uncomfortable ways in which Hamilton portrays friendship, we examine what we truly do know, can know, and should know about those close to us. It does not only show how easily one can become lost in a foreign country, but how easily we can become lost in the complexities of our interpersonal relationships. And we are so pleased now to have the privilege of Mr. Hamilton to come and speak to us about his work. Well, first of all, it's, I have to say it's great to be here, uh, and thank you to Joseph Lennon for inviting me to, uh, to take on this ch Heimbold chair this year. Um, I got a wonderful welcome all together from all the colleagues here at, at Villanova, and especially from Jim Murphy, uh, who, who threw a party for me just after we arrived, myself and Mary Rose. So it's, I feel it's almost, almost like coming home here. In fact, I was saying this to Joe earlier on, over here in America, I can feel Irish for the first time. In Ireland, I'm not sure if I ever managed to be fully Irish, because as you heard, uh, part of my background is German. My mother came from Germany to Ireland uh, after the war in 1949. So, uh, so I was always, you know, at a little, slight disadvantage because um, anyone who's read The Speckled People will have had this image of myself and my brother running around the streets in Dublin wearing lederhosen and arid sweaters. <laughs> so that's not actually the, uh, that's not actually the Irish uh, way of dressing up in the 1950s. You know? So there was something odd about us. So it's nice to be here in America where people in supermarkets uh, notice something about me and say, you must be Irish, you know? That's such a compliment. Um, in fact, uh, America is not the place where I would naturally say that I was German. In fact, I met a woman at the weekend who came from Berlin. Uh, she married a Jewish man after the war and came to live in America and he lost his job because he had married a German woman. And in order for him to get his job back, she had to go and do elocution lessons, how to learn to speak English without a German accent. So that's how little being German was appreciated here in Germany, in, in North America. And that's not, oh yeah, okay. <clears throat> No, and it's, it's actually very similar to the experience my mother had in Ireland. Uh, we kind of grew up in a time in the 1950s, early 60s, uh, where the Nazis, uh, the remaining Nazis had been put on trial. Uh, so you can imagine how we, we were looked at wearing lederhosen on the streets of Dublin. Uh, Eichmann, I don't know how many of you we remember the name Eichmann, Adolf Eichmann. He was put on trial when I was about sort of five or six. And so the, the local kids got a great kick out of putting me on trial then and calling me Eichmann. So it's great, you know, I've, been tr been, uh, I've spent the whole of my life trying to be as Irish as possible. I've, I've tried to drink as much as possible. I've tried to sing a few Irish songs, and now it's great to be in supermarkets here in Philadelphia, and people saying, yes, you're Irish. <laughs> I have, all, I have the, um, the certificate at last. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I'm going to read you a few passages. As Joe mentioned, 
Um, I've recently adapted the, the Speckled People into a play, uh, and it ran at the Gay Theatre. And um, so I'd like to read you one or two small passages from that, uh, since it is my latest work. Um, <clears throat> to begin with, I just wanted to give you an idea of us as children and um, the landscape that we grew up in. Um, I like to repeat this because I think it makes even more sense when I come here to North America. Is it? It's on. Oh, it's on. Let's, let's see if this works any better. Oh. Yeah. <clears throat> okay, it makes, me, it makes it easier. Yeah, I like, I like to say this because I think it's quite, it has quite a resonance here for a lot of people in North America. Is that when I, when I grew up, the, the first line in The Speckled People it says, I woke up in Germany and then I looked out the window and saw Ireland. And I think that must be quite a familiar feeling for, for a lot of people here. Um, in that I grew, actually grew up in Germany. And then later on as a child, at the age of three or four, I emerge onto the streets in Dublin. And I realize after a while that this is not Germany. These are actually, the streets are diff have different names. I, I remember very distinctly when I, I first arrived in Kempen, the town that my mother came from in Germany. Myself and my brother Franz already knew how to get to the bakery from my aunt's house. We had the map of that town. But the map of that town seems to have been sort of overlaid onto the streets of Dunleary where I grew up as a child. So we were kind of almost living on the wrong map. We were kind of living in the wrong streets in, in some ways. And I remember, because we spoke German all the time, my mother would talk about der Metzger, and she would talk, talk about der Schumacher, and these are sort of, that's the, the word for butcher and shoemaker. And so how were we to know that these were Irish shoemakers and Irish shoemaker? And I remember one particular shoemaker and we used to go in and uh, shout into the, in, in the door and he would be working away in the background and he would shout back us, at us, give a big roar. And I don't know why, but for some reason, I still like to believe that he's a German shoemaker living in Sandikov. Um, so that's how confused we were as children. We had sort of Irish history. My father used to make these great speeches at the breakfast table. My mother used to send us to bed in this strange country in Germany with all her stories of, of, uh, of her, her town. So we were confused in this, and living in between this country, Ireland, Ireland and Germany. Um, yes, and um, also there were, there were, we realised then as children that there were Irish rules and German rules. For instance, um, Irish people have a very interesting way of speaking and particularly the Irish way of telling the truth is very different from the German way of telling the truth. Uh, my mother told us, you know, if you were asked a question, you always answer truthfully. You say, you give the answer exactly as you, uh, as you would tell your mother. And I actually realised when I was growing up then that that was a very bad idea. Because in Ireland, you don't answer the question truthfully. In fact, the first thing you do in Ireland is you, you ask the person who asked you a question, what are you asking me for? Why do you want to know that? So there's a much more skillful way of, of t talking and telling the truth in Ireland. And I think that's one of the reasons, you know, the, one of the factors that have led to a great sort of flowering of Irish literature, that, that we have such a skillful way of, of dealing with language in Ireland. Um, <clears throat> I want to describe to you from my book and from the play one of those confusions and how, as a child, I dealt with those, the Irish rules and the German rules on, on the other hand. 
and how as a child you play your mother and your father against each other. You know how your mother is thinking inside and you, how, you know how your father is thinking and you know how to get them to play off each other. <clears throat> This is a scene, um, first of all, in The Speckled People, where we've started going a little bit mad. I mean, uh, it's quite understandable that we German Irish children would get everything mixed up. And, um, but we started doing crazy things inside and outside the house. At home, my mother started... Sta says we started doing some strange things. When it was nearly dinner time, she told me to put a bowl of mashed potato on the table. My father was talking to her in the kitchen and she was listening and cooking at the same time. So I carried the bowl of mashed potato up to the room where we play and took the lid off. With a spoon, I threw a bit of mashed potato at the wall. It stayed there and we looked at it for a while. I threw another spoonful at the ceiling and it stuck there as well. It made a strange sound each time, like a click. It made a different shape each time as well, sometimes a little cloud and sometimes a spike t pointing downwards. Maria, my sister, said she was going to run and tell on me, but I told her, that we had to make a sacrifice. I closed the door and said it was our duty to do this for Ireland. <laughs> we had to make as many shapes as we could. So Franz took lumps out with his hand and together we tried to cover the whole ceiling. Sometimes a lump came unstuck and fell down again and Maria started screaming. We laughed and threw more and more of it up until it was all gone and the whole room was covered. My mother came in and saw the glass bowl empty on the floor. She said we were going out of our minds. My father rushed into the room and looked at the bits of mashed potato on the ceiling and said they would never come off. They would be there forever. We were in real trouble now. But my mother would not let him hit us. Instead of getting angry, she said, you couldn't punish a thing like that because it happened only once in a lifetime. My father was still frowning, but then she put her arm around him and said, it didn't matter going without mashed potato for one day. She said, they were lucky to have children with such imagination. She smiled and said, you had to have an imagination to do something as mad as that. So that gives you an insight into us slowly going crazy in this house, this German-Irish household, and getting away with it. Uh, my mother often had this uh, great skill that she brought with her, with her from Germany, uh, and she needed it to get around my father because he had such a, an uncompromising way of dealing with his family. Uh, as I say in the play, he never learned how to be a father, and. Uh, so for him, the whole thing was like a, a cultural battle. Uh, he wanted the Irish language to be spoken. He wanted to get rid of the English language, so he refused to allow any English to be spoken inside the house. And my mother had to find subtle ways to get around him every now and again. Um, I'm going to read you the same scene um, from the play. And this scene is at the beginning of Act 3. And it begins with um, the stage set instructions. Uh, my father had all these enterprises that he wanted to uh, carry out. You know, there, he was very industrious and very, you know, he really wanted to do something for Ireland. That's where I got this idea for, of throwing mashed potato at the ceiling for Ireland because you know, he, everything he did was for his country and for his family. And at one stage, himself and his wife, my mother, Irmgard, uh, 
you know, thought of all these different schemes. Like she started a chocolate factory. Um, they imported crucifixes from Germany. Uh, but each time there was some kind of problem because either the shopkeeper who was buying these things would write out the cheque in English and that wasn't good enough. The, he would say the shopkeeper would have to pay again in Irish. Um, there was always some complication in between and sort of the Irish language is bad for business in the end. But his final um, enterprise was, was to get beehives. And he kept these beehives on a, on a flat roof over the kitchen. And uh, he was hoping to get rich by selling honey. And, uh, but in a way, that's his demise in the end, because eventually in the book and in the play, the bees rise up against him. And it's, he's killed by his own bees. Um, so I begin with that uh, act three. The stage is lit, the same minimal architecture with only one key addition. There's a beehive standing on stage. We hear the bu buzzing of Ligeti music, ramifications. It has the sound of bees. Father enters from the right, dressed as a beekeeper and wearing beekeeper's mesh covering his head. On his arms, he wears white elbow length gloves. He walks like an astronaut, limping across the stage with his arms in the air. The boy enters from the left, tracking his father as he crosses the stage. Boy, now is the time of the bees and everybody is getting stung. Father kneels down on one knee with his hand on the top of the hive facing towards the audience. Father, we'll show them. We'll show them that we have no weakness, no fear and no weakness and no history holding us back. They said it was my limp, something in the family, big crowd outside the house, standing in the street, waiting for him to be brought out, my father. They said I was not right in the head either because I had a limp from birth. They didn't think I was going to be where I am today with my own family and my own bees. They're going to be afraid of us now. They're going to be afraid of us and there's nothing they can do to stop you flying out across the walls. Now. Father stands up and steps back to admire the beehive. He removes the beekeeping bee bee mesh from his head. As he takes off the long white gloves, he begins to look at the ceiling. He steps back further towards the centre of the stage, peering up at the ceiling from various angles. Father, Irmgard, come and look at this. Mother enters from the left. Mother, what is it? Father, Hanny, come here at once. Boy comes running forward. Boy, yes? Father, did you do that? Boy, what? Father points up. The ceiling, look at it. Mother looks up. I don't believe it. Father, we'll never get that off. Mother, have you gone out of your mind? Boy, yes. Father, did you do it? Boy, no. <laughs> Father, I don't believe him. Mother, honey, is that an Irish no? Boy, yes. Mother, yes. Boy, no. Mother, an Irish yes. Boy, no. Mother, a German no. Boy, yes. Father, angry. Who else would have done it? Mother, honey, be honest. Did you throw the mashed potato at the ceiling? Boy, no. Mother, is that a silent yes? Boy, no. Mother, the silent negative. Boy, yes. Father, barking, answer the question, yes or no? Boy, no. Father, he's lying. Mother, honey, you can never tell a lie. When somebody asks you a question, you must always tell the truth. Boy, yes. Father, he's going to be punished for this. Mother, why did you do it? Boy, for Ireland. Father, the stick. Mother, no, wait, Sean. He said it was for Ireland. 
Father, what? Mother places her hand on the boy's shoulder. Mother, you must believe him. Father, this is absurd. Mother, it's artistic. Father, mashed potato. Mother, that's the point. You have to have an imagination to do something that makes no sense for your country. Father pointing up, how is that going to help our country? Mother, it's the principle, Sean. Father, is this what they do in Germany? Mother, he's doing his best. Father, he's doing his worst, you mean? Mother, look, sometimes he gets it wrong, but you can't punish him if he did it for Ireland. Silence. Father looks up at the ceiling. Then he looks down at the boy. Father, was it for Ireland? Boy, yes. Father, is that the truth? Boy, yes. Father, the Irish truth. Mother, the German truth. Father, the only truth and nothing but the truth. Boy, cheerfully, yes. Mother and father continue looking in rotation at the ceiling and at each other and at the boy. Father puts his beekeeping mesh back on again and walks off stage. Mother, only you could think of something like that. Something as mad as that, mashed potato on the ceiling. It's like something Franz Kaiser would have done. Your grandfather went into a bakery once and stuck his finger into a cake. Then he lifted it up. How much is this, he asked. They told him the price. She mimes holding a cake on her index finger, then wipes it off. Too expensive, he said, and then he put the cake back. But then he smiled and bought the cake after all. And he bought cakes for all the children on the Buttermark Square as well. Mashed potato. Mother smiles and walks away back to her writing desk. Boy, my mother is good at rescuing us and making detours around my father. She tries to save us from the bees as well and beats them off with a kitchen towel. But sometimes it's too late and she can't stop herself from getting stung. At night, the bees start buzzing around the light bulb, buzzing and bouncing against the ceiling like an angry motorbike. Everybody is afraid. Everybody is afraid of their own nightmares and afraid of getting stung in the dark. So that's the scene uh, with the mashed potato. Uh, and you can see from that scene how, I suppose it happens in every family, that you know, there is actually a contest between the mother and father as to who the child is going to be like. You know? um, <clears throat> My mother was trying to get me to be like her grandfather, her, her father in, in Kempen, who was a wonderful, uh, funny man, a businessman, who was liked by all the people in the town, but who died early when she was only nine. Uh, and my father wants us to be like the Ireland that he imagines, an Ireland where everybody's speaking Irish. And. Uh, it's almost like my father is trying to get Ireland to go back in time. I was telling my students, uh, I was talking to them about a great play written by Brian Friel called Translations. I'm sure many of you have seen this play. It's an extraordinary play about a time when, in Ireland where the landscape is being changed and, and, and all the names of the villages are being changed into the English language. Uh, it's, a, it's a critical time in Irish history. Um, and it's almost as though, as though that moment is being reversed by my father. He wants everything to go back in time. And he wants the names of the, the streets to go back into the Irish language as well. And uh, my mother, coming from Germany, doesn't really know much about Ireland. Um, and she gets conscripted into that language war. Um, <clears throat> I wanted to read you a bit about Connemara. Um, when we were nine years of age, like we, as, as happened often with a lot of children in Dublin City, you, you would get 
a three-month scholarship to go and live in Connemara with an Irish-speaking family. And it was fantastic altogether. First of all, I was away from my father for three months. And that was like a big holiday from life. Um, and there were no rules there about sort of, um, you know, what you had to be or anything like that. We were fully Irish there. Uh, and, and the people in Connemara, in this part of Connemara that I went to live in, uh, in Bail and Dangan, on the, on this, right on the coast, they thought lederhosen were great things, you know. They, and they, wa they wanted to know what they could be ordered. They wanted to know if my mother could, you know, order a few, a few for them, because they really were indestructible. And uh, they were all walking around with holes in their trousers. And um, even the, the adults wanted pairs of these leather trousers, you know. Um, so I got the nickname there, Dublin Jack. That's who I was. Uh, but we spoke Irish all the time. And I've a lasting love for the Irish language since that time. You know? uh, people sometimes ask me, like, what language do I dream in? I often still dream in, in the Irish language. Um, in fact, you know, I, I, was, I was walking in the mountains in Kerry recently and I saw a caterpillar on the, on the path in front of me and I immediately said to Mary Rose, my wife, I said the word in German, Raupe, because that's the word I, I first encountered this creature in. And only afterwards this, I translated it to her as caterpillar. And that happens to me very often, not only in German, but in Irish as well. The word for lobster, for instance, always comes to me in Irish first, glumuk. And then it goes to English, or it goes to German, Hummer, and then eventually ends up in English. So when you hear me speaking in English, a lot of the words I'm speaking actually go around the house first through three languages before they actually are, are voiced by me. And I say this in my, my book, and I think I express this in a lot of my work, including my latest novel, Hand on the Fire, that there is a sort of a simultaneous translation happening all the time inside the head of a migrant. And not only a migrant, but the descendants of migrants. You know, we do inherit that, uh, that need to catch up with the rest of the country. And that's what, uh, effectively, that's my obsession as a writer. That's what I've lived through. Um, <clears throat> so here I am trying to be as Irish as possible in Connemara. <clears throat> After that, we tried to be as Irish as possible. We went to Connemara for three months to be as Irish as possible. We got new caps and new rain -macks and went on the train with a group of boys who were all going to live in a full Irish fireside. We were going to school in the Gaeltacht, in the Irish-speaking Gaeltacht, and we would come back as native speakers. At the station, a photographer came to take our picture for the newspapers, and my mother kept it in her diary. Franz and me and the other boys waving goodbye on the platform, because we'd be away, we would not speak any English for, for three months. Franz went to a place called Ankaru Rua, and I went to a new place called Bailandangan. But I was sick again, and howling, the howling started up in my chest every night. The people in the house were very nice to me, but sometimes I wanted to go home because I couldn't breathe. I had lots of trouble with dogs howling in my chest. The local doctor came and he said I would get over it soon, but I was coughing all the time and I had to stay in bed. Then the woman of the house, Bannon T, gave me a packet of cigarettes that were good for asthma. She bought a packet of sweet afton and put them beside my bed with a box of matches. She told me that if I fell short of breath at any time, I should light up a cigarette and smoke away like a good man, because that would help me cough it all up, cough up all the bad stuff and not be afraid of the dark. Then I got better again and forgot that I was German and started learning how to live in Irish. 
There was a boy named Pather in the house who showed me how to get water and how to milk the cows. Bannon T, the woman of the house, taught me how to find all the places where the hens laid eggs. I helped Farron T to stack turf against the, the side of the house, and I learned how to say Gudach de Shehu, which is the Irish for I hope it chokes you. I learned how to turn English words into Irish and to say Mo Vicicle and Mochid Biscuits. I learned how to walk to school backwards to stop the hailstones stinging my legs. I watched men gathering seaweed and putting it on big lorries to, to take away to Galway and to be turned into cough medicine. I saw people laying out salted fish on the stone walls to dry them in the sun. I saw the tide going out every day as if it was never coming back and I saw donkeys with their feet tied together to stop them running away and laughing at everybody. There was a curly piece of brown sticky paper hanging in the middle of every room with dead flies stuck to it. There was a dog beside the fire who had his chin on the floor and his eyes closed and he only lifted one ear to hear anyone coming that was coming. Every day a man named Colleen came to visit and sit by the window. He was a cousin belonging to the woman of the house and he would look out at the road and tell them who was passing by. There was a radio in the house but there was no TV and no need for one because the man at the window was the man who said the news. The woman of the house could carry on making the dinner and the man of the house could sit with his pipe by the fireside without looking up. That's Joe Fat going west now with his new coat on, Colleen would say. Here's Nancy Shoige making her way back from the east now with biscuits for her sister. There were four different directions you could go in Connemara. West, from the west, east and from the east. Sometimes they came to, in to visit and then the whole house was like a television programme with the man at the window keeping everybody talking. Nancy Shoyga came in to smoke a fag out of the wind and explained that the biscuits were no good for her sister because she was ill in bed for a long time and the sweet afton were not doing her any good either. She came in from the east and when she was finished telling her story she went back out to the west. There's Tom Fodin Tom going east now with his bicycle and his dog behind him, the man at the window said. Sometimes the woman of the house would ask questions too, like what Tom Fordine Tom was thinking about. And she was told that he was thinking he had spent long enough in the company of the of in his own company on the bog for one day. And he was going east up to Tachy Laharte to buy pipe cleaners and to buy tobacco for himself. The man at the window knew who was going by and who was not going by. He knew what everybody was saying in Connemara, all the conversations that were going on in England and as far away as Boston as well. I see on Sagart the priest, Father O'Moran, has gone up to see the Johnson family yet again about their, sis their son in Birmingham. Porrick Jamesy must have gone up to Galway on the bus for the day because they say he's great with a nurse from Inishmore working in the Galway Regional Hospital. They say that Patricia Wernin Littermoku is getting married in spring in America to a stranger. The man at the window could tell who was up in Taki Laharta and what story they all had. He knew that Tom Fodin Tom was buying more than pipe cleaners because his dog was now coming back from the east already. That meant Martin Hansen was surely up there as well and that Tom Fodin Tom would not be going home until very late unless Peggy and Dorica went up after him with her dark hair to get him out. He knew what all the living people were saying and also what all the dead people were saying in the graveyard. He knew that Tom Fodin Tom's brother Pauline Og was calling out from the grave saying that his throat was dry as a stick and that if he was still alive and hadn't drowned off Rosseville one day, then he would be up in Chaki Laharta and nobody, not even the priest or the Pope, 
in the Vatican or Eamon de Valera himself would get him out until he had sung Born Astrogia and the Rocks of Bawn. One night I had to go up to Takil Ilahar to myself with a blue and white milk jug. The man of the house was not allowed to go up to Takilahar to himself because the priest had told him never to go east or he would never again come back west again. So then I had to go east for him and he told me to be careful on the way back and not spill a single drop. It was dark as I walked along the road towards the lights of Takilaharta. I knew that the man at the window was telling the man at the house, in the house, about me. There's Dublin Jack going in the door of Takilaharta now, carrying the jug with the blue and white stripes. And there's Dublin Jack taking out the money and buying sweets instead. But that was only a joke. Taki Laharta was a big shop with everything you could buy, like jam and sweets and things like cement and wood too. There, were lots, there was lots of smoke and lots of tall men in Wellington boots standing at the counter, all talking at the same time in Irish. They were telling all the stories in Connemara as far away as Boston. I saw Tom Foddy and Tom laughing and smoking a pipe that had a lid on it for the rain. I stood behind them, waiting for a while and looking at the new brushes and buckets hanging from the ceiling, until one of the men turned around to take the jug from me. He told the man behind the counter to fill it up to the top, but because Dublin Jack was very thirsty. I put the money up on the counter, and when the jug was full, they passed it down to me and told me to hold it with both hands. There was cream on the top to stop you looking inside the jug, but you could smell it. Then one of them came to op over to open the door, and I walked back slowly in the dark without turning the jug upside down or meeting any ghosts or falling down into the ditch or getting swallowed up by the ground and never seen again. I didn't spill a single drop, but when I got back, the man of the house looked into the jug for a long time. He asked me, did I drink half of it myself? But then the woman of the house told him I didn't. The man at the window wanted to know if I saw anyone with a tweed cap turned backwards, and that was Martin Handsome. Then the man of the house drank from the side of the jug and started telling a ghost story that happened to himself one time when he was coming back from Taki Laharta in the dark. So that's Connemara. <clears throat> yeah, I don't, want, I don't know if you want to ask him questions or... Um, <clears throat> Go ahead. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, <clears throat> Jim. I, I think so. I mean, I, I describe Connemara in a sort of pre-television age, you know. Um, <clears throat> so it, it was certainly, I mean, this man that I describe is like a talk show host in the house. Everybody, every house had one. And um, of course, Connemara has changed radically. You know, people have built big houses on the landscape. Uh, but there's something quite extraordinary about Connemara that's still left intact, you know. And in, in particular, that sort of, um, that social map that they have, you know. And I describe it there as, you know, by saying like, everybody, knew what everybody was thinking as far away as Boston, you know, and, and Brooklyn and all these places. 
for people in Connemara, you know, Brooklyn and Boston is they're they're parts of Connemara, effectively. You know, they've just drifted a little bit across the Atlantic uh, with the people that went away, and I I often have heard from people in in Connemara that there's more Irish spoken in Boston now than there is in in parts of Connemara. But uh, I, I think, uh, yeah, Connemara is a quite an extraordinary place. I mean, it's, it's not like anywhere else in Ireland. It's quite unique in, and it's worth going there to see what's, I think it's retained parts of Ireland and the Irishness and what I associate with Ireland that other parts of Ireland have not, that, that other parts have lost. And it's that social map and the kind of inquisitiveness of the people. They immediately want to know who you're connected to, where, where, uh, where you belong, and where you fit into this country. Um, I, I remember my, my mother in her diary has wrote, written an, a remarkable piece where she describes calling into these fishermen, uh, and their, their nets are all over the house, and it's just a, an old man and his, and his wife. And she describes the woman of the house shaking her hands, and then the man of the house looks at her for a long time, as though he, he's trying to figure out where he's seen her before. He's trying to figure out where she comes from, or who she might be related to. And she writes this down as, as, as this kind of long look into her eyes. You know? And that's what he was trying to do. He was trying to fit her in on his map of the world. And his map of the world doesn't extend any further than Karurua. Uh, that's the end of the world for him. You know? So it is still this kind of very small place. You know? I, I don't think so. I mean, that's a, it's a very good question, that. Uh, I, I was very lucky with The Speckled People because I published it in 2003 at a time when, when Ireland was kind of quite comfortable with itself for the first time ever. I mean, I describe Ireland as being in a constant state of crisis. Irishness is in a constant state of crisis. Uh, and I think the Celtic Tiger, you know, the, you know, the fact that we had money in our pockets for the first time after, what, a thousand years, you know, allowed people to kind of be more generous and, and to look out uh, from Ireland a little bit more. And I think they accepted that story of the speckled people. And uh, so we have grown up now in, in a lot of ways. Whether that lasts now is, is, is another matter. Um, but, you know, it's still an island. Ireland. And it's not, for a migrant to come to Ireland, it's not the same as coming to America, where there are sort of waves and waves of uh, immigrants coming, coming here. Ireland is not an easy place to understand. And I saw my mother struggling with that. And just the way people say things and the silences that they leave behind, they kind of, um, there's a lot of silence underneath the sentences and, and they're very difficult to figure out, you know. Uh, in Ireland, and I think that's part of the problem w uh, with, with, that migrants have. Um, and also, you know, we Irish, you know, we think it's unfortunate that for people who are not Irish, you know, <laughs> we think Irish being Irish is brilliant. It's the greatest thing that ever was invented. And God help the people coming to Ireland who are not Irish yet. They're going to have to learn fast. I'm still learning <laughs> how to be Irish, you know. I was wondering, how did you negotiate as a child coming back after Connemara? Did you teach 
keep s secret some of the stuff that went on? How, what did you reveal? What did you hide? And how much um, in common did you have with your brother? He went to a different place. Could you yeah. Um, how, how, did, how did I um, look and feel when I came back from Connemara? And was it, was it uh, very different to my brother's experience? Yeah. I, I have a musical ear, and I think that helped me to pick up the language really well. So I came back uh, to Dublin as a completely fluent Irish speaker with a Connemara, a thick Connemara accent. My brother didn't have that, you know. I, I arrived, you know, the, the woman in the house in, in, in Bailentang gave me a chicken to bring home with me. She put it in a basket, and so I went home on the train with the chicken and a thick Irish accent, you know. A complete fluent Irish speaker, so uh, I did everything my father wanted me to, to be, and and uh, and I went back to school where they all spoke Irish, but they they thought it was hilarious that I had this that I spoke like a native speaker, uh, and I hadn't realised it. I just came back speaking Irish, and, uh, but I picked it up, you know, um, and I still have that accent I, I, uh, now. So I was, um, I was a foreigner coming back again to my own place for another reason, for having Irish. And, uh, and uh, that was almost even funnier than, than speaking German to the people in Dunleary. You know. Maybe we could just have another question and then... <clears throat> The Northern Lights in Connemara, Northern I've never seen them, you know. It's very far west. And um, there's very little light pollution there, so you can see the stars very clearly. If there's a bright sky, yeah. Could we give Hugo Hamilton a big round of applause? <laughs> Thank you.